listening to It's All About Food. How are all of you out there doing today? We've been having a very challenging time on this planet, haven't we? Every time I look in the news, and it doesn't matter where you get your news, either on television, on your phone, or on paper, but we keep reading about this pandemic that doesn't seem to want to go away. And I wish the very best for all of you out there. I'm not sure how you are managing it. My partner Gary and I are in California right now. We're directing a show. We're so excited to be back working in theater. And at the same time, we're getting a little nervous because there are so many theaters all around right now that are starting to close again because people are concerned about this new wave. Not only do we have the Delta variant, but we have Omicron variant. And all I can share with you is this. We all need to do the best that we can. And what does that mean? Priority number one, which we never hear about, or at least never hear about enough or in mainstream media, is that to protect ourselves, we need to eat and fuel ourselves with the very best nutrition that we can get. And that means a whole food, minimally processed, varied plant diet, food that comes from plants, high fiber food, food that doesn't come in a box, food that is next to fresh for the most part. It can be lightly steamed and, and minimally processed. But so many foods out there today that are available that are accessible and expensive for people are highly processed. And this is part of our problem. So a whole food, minimally processed plant diet, the kind of diet that we talk about on this show all the time, either free of or very little salt, oil, and sugar. These are the things that we can do for ourselves to protect ourselves. And of course, wear a mask when you're with people that aren't in your pod, when you're in the public, Gary and I have been vaccinated. We've been boosted. I know this is a sensitive issue with some people, but personally, I think it's necessary. And the only way we're going to really get a handle on this pandemic. I wish I heard more about encouraging people to eat better. This is what we've been doing on this program since it began in 2009, because not only is there this COVID-19 pandemic, but if you look at it, there is a pandemic of chronic diseases. We just don't perceive it that way. But so many people have ill health because of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and certain cancers and autoimmune diseases. And so many of these can be what? Reduced or prevented. They can be reduced or prevented by what we consume. And when do we hear about this? We only hear it on, in the alternative media spaces. So I will continue <laughs> to be a broken record and encourage you to do the best you can with nutrition. Meanwhile, we have to live on this planet together and we all drink the same water and we all breathe the same air and we all eat food that comes from the same soil. And that's why it's important that we do the best we can for ourselves because it also helps everybody else. We're all in this together. And when people say, I don't want to follow a certain rule because I can do whatever I want, that shows a lack of consideration for the fact that we're all living in this same space together. Now, some people may not want to acknowledge this, but <laughs> where else are you going to go? Right now, we don't have the ability to jump to another planet, another planet that might be hospitable to us. So my message is that we cooperate and do the best we can for ourselves, for our families, for our friends, for our communities, for our planet. I have one of the most wonderful people on the planet to talk to me today, Jonathan Balcombe. Jonathan Balcombe was born in England raised in New Zealand and Canada, and has lived in the United States since 1987. He is a biologist with a PhD in ethology, the study of animal behavior. He is the author of 
Popular science books on the inner lives of animals, including Pleasurable Kingdom, Second Nature, and What a Fish Knows, a New York Times bestseller, and Superfly. He has published over 60 scientific papers and book chapters on animal behavior and animal protection. Formerly department chair for animal studies with the Humane Society University and director of animal sentience with the Humane Society Institute for Science and Policy, Jonathan works as an independent author and performs editing services for aspiring and established authors. He also serves as an associate editor for the journal Animal Sentience, and he teaches a course in animal sentience for the Viridis Graduate Institute. A popular speaker, Jonathan has lectured on six continents. The penguins eagerly anticipate his arrival in Antarctica. Jonathan currently lives in southern Ontario, where in his spare time, he enjoys biking, baking, birding, Bach, and trying to understand the squirrels in his neighborhood. I am delighted, everybody, to bring back on the program Jonathan Balcombe. You may remember him. We have talked about two of his wonderful books, What a Fish Knows, and the other one was Superfly. An unforgettable title. Both books, I think, were really in a world all of their own, in a class all of their own. Not a lot of information has been written on these subjects, and certainly not from the perspective that you've taken, which which is more like from the perspective of the fish and the fly and what they might be feeling. Because us humans, we're not very good at that. And now... You have a new book called Jake and Ava, a boy and a fish. And it's a children's book. Although I think some adults might enjoy reading it too. Certainly hope so. Yes. So I'm just curious when you write a children's book, which is very short, how do you choose what you want to write about and what you're going to say in so few words? It's almost like writing poetry. That's a great point. Uh, I'm, I'm new to it. I'm not exactly a seasoned children's book writer. This is my first. Uh, I, have, I have drafted a, a script or a, a text for another one along similar structural lines. But yeah, it is, it is an, an exercise in conciseness. Um, it's also an exercise, and this I think applies to writing for any audience, in a form of empathy where you, you, have to, you, you want to try and place yourself in the mind of the the target audience, in this case, a very different audience than grown-ups. Um, nevertheless, like clever filmmaking, like the Pixar films, they're funny for the grown-ups too, or they're entertaining for the grown-ups. And so that's an important element. Mind you, with the, with the, with film and with an illustrated, you know, pic, a book with pictures, even grown-ups love pictures. We're, 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 we're quite happy to see pictures of things. So, so I think that that's not a hard sell in terms of uh, reaching the grown-ups. But keeping the kids interested and making it relevant to them, I think, is 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 an important part of the exercise. So, it went through many drafts, and of course, mm. the first draft was was way too many words. Uh, but it's easier to cull and to add usually. So. Um, you know, it went through many, many readings. I had teachers and, and family members who were in education read it. And uh, it was really helpful. Uh, even something as basic as the tense, you know, my first draft, it was past tense. It's like my, my sister, who was a school teacher for years for elementary level, said, uh, why not present tense? And it was like, duh, why didn't I think of that? I mean, it was so obvious, uh, so much better, it was so much more lively and present uh, once I had the present tense. So I've, I learned a lot doing that. There's a lot more to learn, I'm sure. But um, it is it is definitely a different exercise than writing a grown up book. Well, I think most people, when they pick up a children's book, would have no idea what goes into it because it seems so simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hindsight uh, makes it yeah. makes it look makes it look easy. I just I just read the other day. Is it a boy and an ant? I don't know if that's the title, but it's a rhyming. The the text is rhyming. It's it's a boy with his shoe poised over this little ant. He's ready to squash it. And, and they have this conversation and the ant yeah. is defending himself and the boy is justifying why he should squash the ant. And uh, it's, uh, it's a little tense and it's touching and it actually doesn't get resolved at the end. 
um, it leaves it open, uh, which was I thought was an interesting device. But uh, I'd seen the, that cover of that book before. I think it's a pretty widely read book, but it's such a powerful tool to to generate reflection, uh, hopefully empathy, uh, consideration of others. I mean, all these basic values that, that are so fundamental to a, a healthy society, um, and yet. You look at the you look at the children's book literature or the literature in general on animals, and so often the message is mixed at best. I'm remembering a few books that I read when I was a child, the ones that I remember. And the first one that I read, and I can't even say that I was reading it, my sister was learning to read, and I may have been memorizing it with the pictures, but it was Dr. Seuss. The first page was one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> yeah, classic. Yeah. What's important about children's books is in addition to our parents and the people that are around us, feeding us with information as we're growing up, these books provide a part of our foundation and our socialization. And unfortunately, there are so many children's books that send an inappropriate message and they're they're changing not changing fast enough for animals obviously and that's why books like yours are so important i remember the there were always you know the dick and jane stories i don't know if you had them you know a little boy a little girl and a dog (laughs) and we just assume so many things from those early images and of course many of those children's books don't tell the truth that we see those bucolic images of farm animals romping around, chewing their, the grasses and mm-hmm. in the green mm-hmm. fields. And none of that's even true anymore. Yeah. It's like the milk cartons, right? Pictures on the milk cartons, happy cows, the three happy pigs singing a song as you go into the place that serves pork, mm-hmm. you know, of course that's, that's directed as much at grownups as, as children, but the exactly. message is the same, the mixed message. Now I have some friends who allow their child to fish and he goes off fishing with his uncle and it's a very wonderful experience for the two of them that bond and spending the time together and there's a certain amount of peacefulness being in nature and yet what they're doing is really quite horrific because the older one is teaching the younger one how to murder but nobody sees it that way. I would love to give, <laughs> give your book to them, but I don't know that they're the people that would be open and receptive to seeing something like this or even know how to accept it. So who do you see this book for? Well, obviously, uh, as, a, as an author, uh, I hope it's read widely. The, the wider the audience, the better. And if it gets in, into the hands of those who fish or, or think fishing is great, all, all the better. Because um, it, may, it may tweak a nerve or, mm-hmm. or, or, or reach them in a certain way. Um, uh, it's certainly directed at, at, at children. Uh, a big goal, uh, if not the ch- the chief goal of my that I have with this book is to hopefully validate the very feelings that I had when I was a kid taken out fishing. It's I mean it's mm. more, particularly for boys, but certainly girl uh, girls as well to some degree. It's a rite of passage. Uh, um, it, it's often treated that way and viewed that way. You know, taking the kid out fishing. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, I think a lot of social pressure on, on the child to sort of conform or to, to go along with it and be excited. And, 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 and some kids do, do feel excitement. I mean, I felt Mm -hmm. excitement. It was very exciting when I felt that, that pull on the, on the hook, you know, what's it going to be? Oh, I get to see, but, but, you know, when I started to see what was happening to that fish, when it was pulled out of the water, I mean, uh, as the great Canadian pianist said, uh, Glenn Gould, when he first went fishing at around the same age as I was, around eight years old, I, as soon as that fish came out of the water, I, I immediately saw things from the perspective of the fish uh, instead of my perspective. And uh, so that's a natural empathy. Um, you know, that he went on to leave half his estate to, uh, um, I think it was the uh, one of the animal welfare charities. Uh-huh. So he clearly had a soft spot for animals. I think a lot of us have soft spots for animals. It's not an unusual thing. 
Um, but it's complicated. It's complicated in the social pressures, the dynamics at play. Um, I, uh, I was deeply disturbed by seeing a uh, fish hanging on a hook, gasping. I was, I was, I was informed enough to know that they, they did, they most, most kids know that fish die if they're out of water. Um, and uh, I wanted the fish to go back. That was my first thing that I wanted. It was my new priority as soon as that fish came out. And, and some of the small ones, the, the, the adult who took a uh, camp director who took me fishing, tossed them back. Uh, but bigger ones, and we caught several larger bass and even some yellow perch that were quite sizable. They were to be kept for breakfast the next morning. And uh, he, he plunged his knife into their skulls. And I, I watched him doing this. And it was... I described this at the very beginning of my book, What a Fish Knows, and it was kind of grotesque to me. Um, I wasn't old enough to process it morally, though, to the degree of, of making some, some firm decision inside to not fish anymore. I did fish. I did fish again. Not a lot. And I totally get the peace and the serenity of being on the water. Um, it's a, it, in that way, it's a lovely activity. Fortunately, we can... We, we don't have to be harming animals to be experiencing the tranquility of a lake in the in the evening. And there are other challenging ways, you know, snorkeling, birding. I, I'm a birder that, you know, making a list of birds is, is fun and, and exciting and can be can be very enjoyable, especially when you see something rare. So I, I don't think we we can really defend the activity based on those kind of qualities of the experience. Um, uh, there are other ways to, to get some of those experiences, ways that don't require uh, harming uh, other sentient beings. Have you seen the fishing rod that doesn't have a hook at the end? It has a little feeder and it shakes food out oh, for the fish. I have heard of this. Yeah. What are they, is there a term for that? I, I'll look for it. I don't know, but I, I have I seen it. Yeah, I did encounter it that, that once. <laughs> I don't know what of, to make of it. I had mixed feelings when I saw it. Yeah. It seemed possibly a, a possibly um, a, a sort of a joke, or but, but maybe not. Uh, oh, and, it and wasn't it may, a it wasn't a joke. I believe it was saw. from some sort of uh, vegan organization, just <laughs> trying putting to, a different angle on it. Yeah, exactly. no pun intended, by the way. <laughs> so it's a way where you can still have that bonding experience, be in that calm environment, sit on a boat and be quiet. And maybe interact with fish, right? When they exactly. come to feed. It's a nice right. idea. Nice yeah. idea. Now, I, I don't know how it would impact the fish in terms of what they should and shouldn't be eating and where they should mm -hmm. expect to get their food from, but it just seems a whole lot nicer than a hook. Yeah, I have visions of the fish is complaining that it's junk food. They, they want <laughs> higher quality food in the future, please. I like that. <laughs> Uh, so what I'm envisioning is somebody's looking for a stocking stuff or somebody's looking for a book for a child and they see this book. And I love the fact that you don't know what it's about on the front cover. It's, it's very simple. Jake and Ava, a boy and a fish. And it's a, a pretty little picture just looks like any regular old children's book. And so they could pick it up and they don't even look through it. And then they give it to the child and they sit down and read it together and then experience the story together. I would love to be a fly on the wall, one of your super flies on the wall. <laughs> well, I, cer I certainly don't intend it to be a subversive book or, or any trickery involved. Uh, you're right. Uh, it, it's not the typical message, although I think it's a fairly gently conveyed message. Mm -hmm. um, and uh and it's it's both fish friendly and human friendly too. I think that can be argued. Have you seen the film Sea Spiracy? I'm happy to say I'm actually in the film briefly. Yes, of course. In, in a cameo towards the end. That's right. I saw it. I remember that, and and made sense that you were there. I don't know how many people have seen that, and of course, when it came out, there was a lot of pushback about it because nobody wants to really own own the truth. I don't think that'll happen to your book. Well, I suppose time will tell. I'm not known as a children's book writer, so the book is uh, currently uh, wallowing in or floating around in relative obscurity. Uh, <laughs> but there have been a, a few nice reviews written on, on Amazon.com so far, so that's yeah. nice to see. Have you, do you know any children who have read the book and what they've thought? 
you know, I thought I was going to get that first opportunity when uh, my my partner and I we visited her family, one of her siblings, and they 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 have a four year old son, and we gave them a book as a gift, and we had fun together, the, the boy and I. We interacted a lot, played games, and for whatever reason, he wasn't ready to read that book. <laughs> he, he said, "Should we read Jake and Ava? Should we read Jake and Ava, Boy and a Fish?" No, not today, you know, and we were only there a couple of days. So I was thinking, you know, it'd be interesting to see how he reacts to this book, but I, I haven't, I haven't oh, uh, had that you experience need to yet. to see that. Yeah, sooner or later. I would like to see, later. this is my request for you. I would like to see a little video. Maybe it could be a promo for this book or maybe just a fun thing where you get maybe five or six children in a circle and you read the book to them and get their reactions. That's a really good idea. I don't know. I haven't, well, I haven't thought of that. I should uh, discuss that with my publisher. Yeah, I would love to see that. Thanks for suggesting it. I'm writing it down. Oh, good. <laughs> I think interactions with children are so powerful. We've had some ideas, my partner Gary and I, on doing some things related to food with children. We haven't done them yet, but kind of spins on some projects we've seen done not for vegan food, but just for food in general. Children often tell the truth in that innocent, charming, somewhat um, unoffensive way. What words am I looking for? You know what I mean? Genuine. Genuine, yeah. Sincere. And I think also reaches into each one of us, the child that's in us that we may have pushed down in order to get by in society. So children can be very helpful. Yeah, they, I, I, I like that they're, un, they're often unvarnished. They're, they're, not, they're not filtering things the way we learn to do, uh, to, to be careful not to offend or what have you. They just speak their mind. So uh, I certainly would love to see that um, that kind of reaction to, to the book. I don't assume it's, it's all, it would all be positive. Uh, it may be mixed depending on the audience, uh, sure. um, as, as with adults as, as well, of course. So, but, but if you, if, if you generate, um, criticism of any sort, negative or positive, um, then I think it's good because you've, you've caused some neurons to fire. You've engaged, people i think it was george bernard shaw who said something like you know uh we we we, we don't like hate hatred or, or a really negative reaction but give me a negative reaction over indifference any day because indifference somebody is just mm. ap apathetic and doesn't care that's scary mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't care if somebody passionately argues for something that you know, say for fishing fishing is important it's really good at least they have passion they're thinking about it they're they're processing it and i've found that often people who have people in that ilk of that ilk are, are more likely to have a complete turnaround um, because they're engaged than, than somebody who just doesn't give mm. a damn very very good point when we're when we don't give a damn in some ways we shut down mm -hmm. i guess that's that's a coping mechanism for some people this is yeah. a difficult planet we live on very challenging life. It's. I think it's a very cha big challenge to have one of what what we have a human brain uh, with the complex society, the emotionality that we have. Uh, you know, the, the complications we have to deal with, the bureaucracy, the red tape, taxes, and stuff like that. Making a living, social pressures. It's not easy owning mm -hmm. a brain. You know, apropos what you shared with me earlier. Now let's just talk about the illustrations in the book for a minute and Rebecca Evans. So I'm assuming the story was finished before she started illustrating it. That's correct. Uh, my publisher has published, it's a very small publisher. They've done um, the Griffin Press, excellent, based in, in Minnesota, really super people to work with. Um, they've done maybe 20 books or so over the, over the course of their, their um, business history. And um, they've, they've used Rebecca a number of times and uh, they thought that uh, she, she, she does sort of watercolor, mm -hmm. uh, fairly loose style. Obviously, well, I maybe shouldn't say obviously, but, but I, can, I can assure you, and you probably know, watercolor lends itself very well to aquatic themes. Uh, it's a wet medium, and so it has a wet look. And uh, just, uh, you know, I, I looked at a sample and immediately liked, liked it, liked the approach, liked her characterizations. 
so it was delightful to have her do that. You know, it's a real privilege. And when you think of the, the relative amount of work of writing a, what ends up being an 800 to 1,000 word manuscript compared to doing a, you know, 20 paintings or so, <laughs> wow. I mean, she's got a bigger job than I did. And um, she did a terrific job. I think it really uh, conveys the message beautifully. I was going to say that maybe her challenge wasn't as difficult as yours, figuring out what exactly you were going to say in so many words, but then I didn't say it, but now I just did say it. <laughs> but you're right. Uh, every page is a painting. And I don't know how many people have attempted watercolor. I know I have. And I think it's one Me of the too. most difficult mediums. Yeah, it's considered a, a fairly unforgiving medium uh, because unforgiving. once once you got it on there, you can't take it off. You can't cover it up as you can with those opaque, uh, you know, oil paints or acrylics. It's watercolor. Once you got a mark on there, it's it, there's a few techniques you can use right for pale marks, but uh, limited. Uh, anything darker, it's there to stay. Yeah. So I it's can't you can't really I, back up. When I used to paint and I would make a mistake and I would try and blot it out, it I. Jess was very muddy. <laughs> yeah, I know that term. <laughs> muddy. But these are beautiful, really, really beautiful. So I'm wondering the little boy in the in the pictures, was he modeled after someone? You'd have to ask Rebecca Evans that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was kind of thinking of myself a little bit when I wrote the book because I had a similar experiences that I, to, what, to what I describe of Jake. But uh, I don't know if she modeled it on... Hmm. modeled him uh, and for that matter his his grandpa whether they, they were modeled on particular individuals she knows i would i would say maybe may, maybe that is the case uh, you certainly want consistency from one page to the other with the characters so to have a familiar face might might help with that i just love it <laughs> i'm glad i'm proud of it i'm 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 proud of it i i'm i'm glad it's out there i hope it'll do some good in the world mm -hmm. I don't know when children's books like this started. I know there aren't many, but there are more than there used to be. And I knew maybe two decades ago, parents, young parents in the plant-based food movement, just clamoring. We need stories for our children. And they just weren't there. I remember a few that came out. Ruby Roth. You know Ruby Roth? I don't. I don't. I don't know that name off the top of my head. Yeah, she had a few. And you're really in a difficult place trying to tell the truth and not offend. You know, if you wanted to talk about factory farming, for example, um, that's, that's a, very challenging because, you know, maybe you want to show some of those images. I mean, in your lovely book, for the most part, all the images are just lovely, beautiful, and it's knowing what's happening in the picture where our imagination can take it further, which in many ways is more powerful when we let our imagination take the story, especially with children, I think. Anyway, so it'll be interesting to see over time what children's books will come out, especially with factory farming. Do you have a plan to write any more books? Yeah, absolutely. I I, I, I've written a draft for uh, an interaction between a school school age girl, young young girl, maybe nine or ten, and uh, a, a caterpillar who she her life literally collides with while riding home from from school, and um, you know, the story is still very much in development. I have a first draft, but um, I need to get some feedback on that. Uh, and there's myriad other ideas. The sort of the general one of the one of the approaches I took with with Jake and Ava, a boy and a fish. I mean, the fish we haven't mentioned that yet. The fish is an archer fish, which is uh, one of six species, six species of archer fish worldwide. They're all in the old world in the in the in the tropical uh, Australia and Southeast Asia, and they're remarkable because they use water as a tool, as a ballistic tool to squirt water at insects uh, above the water, uh, which draws a parallel, an interesting parallel between. The, the humans going fishing and the and young Ava, a young fish going, trying to catch insects with their dad. Um, and they also they also are known through careful scientific studies, published studies, to learn by observation. So those are two those are two two pretty high level cognitive uh, skills that um, 
50 years ago, we probably didn't know about. I suppose people had seen archer fishes squirting water, but uh, it wasn't that long ago that tool use, never mind observational learning, uh, were, were uh, on a list of things that humans thought we were the only ones to do. And of course, tool use is now known to be widely practiced by many, many different animals, and many taxa, including insects, um, and certainly including fishes, birds, reptiles, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and so uh, that, that's part of the educational backdrop of this book is, is to also enlighten readers uh, as much as much the adults as the kids to the capacities of fishes, both uh, cognitive or, or intelligence and, uh, and emotional capacities that until recently we denied them and still many people deny them now. It ain't the case as I showcase in, in my book, What a Fish Knows, um, uh, fishes have incredibly rich inner lives. They, they have biographies, not just biologies. And that's kind of part of the message here. And there's a page 24, sort of a descriptive text at the back for grownups to read, um, which gives some more background on recreational fishing, on fishes and their emotional and cognitive capacity. So uh, that's, a, that's a sort of a, a, an educational aspect. I also want to mention that there's um, a, a number of lesson plans that have been drawn up by by colleagues of mine at, at HART, and I need to remember what HART stands for. Humane educators. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know HART, yeah, they're humane something, educators. Yeah. yeah, something teachers, reaching teachers. Uh, they did a terrific job. They, 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 they made a, a series of lesson plans tailored mm -hmm. to uh, the young age that this is about three through eight is a typical age, so early school age. Um, classroom exercises with the, the equipment listed and, and of course focused around the book and the story. Um, and uh, the group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals has also done a couple of, um, put together, um, Lisbeth Chiraboga there has put together uh, with her colleagues has put together a couple of lesson plans as well. So, you know, this part of the, the, the effort to make this book more widely accessible and usable in the educational context is to have these resources already pre-made uh, that can be used and if, if, if teachers want adapted for their own particular setting. It's brilliant what you did and using the archer fish. I learned about it. I had never known that they were capable of doing this or had seen anything like that. But I could see, as you mentioned, they hunt for the insects. And I could see how someone might say, you know, we're all supposed to be eating each other. <laughs> this is just the way it is, right? Yeah, it's a, the world it's a that good... we're in, right? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a legitimate question. And I, and I, thought about that in in conceiving this story is the 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 comparison the parallels i wanted it to be two parallel stories that coalesced and so to strengthen the parallel you know you got a a, a young human going out to do something for the first time which involves catching another animal and you got a, a young fish going out to do something the first time that involves catching another animal uh, and one could 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 legitimately say you know what's the difference you know why why do we have this double standard I mean, my my response to that would be that uh, the fishing scenario is a recreational one it's called recreational fishing i mean worldwide humans catch close to 50 billion rec uh, fish recreational every year. This is an estimate based on a published study. And, uh, you know, uh, so many of them are thrown back, uh, but many of them are, are kept and, and killed. And of those that are thrown back, mortality, subsequent mortality is actually not that, not that uncommon. And certainly in injuries and bl blindness and other things ha can happen to these, to these animals. So that, I think that is a very important fundamental difference here is the, the recreational fishing is a, is a choice we make. It's an activity we, we do. Uh, I'm not really targeting, trying to target subsistence fishing where coastal communities maybe have fished for uh, millennia and they have a, 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 what we could regard as a truly sustainable balance with the fish. Uh, no, I'm, I'm looking at those who, who go out. I mean, I live here on Lake Ontario. I, I see it. They have big competitions every year. This is big business and it's a big deal, uh, recreational fishing. Um, and so, but it's ultimately done by choice. Uh, those people don't have to do it. Uh, the fish, on the other hand, the fishes, um, in the case of an archer fish, they do catch food under underneath the water, uh, but they uh, they also have evolved this wonderful ability, this remarkable ability to be 
quite accurate marksmen for insects. So they are kind of making a living. It's more of a subsistence for them. I think that's a really important uh, com comparator. And the story doesn't get into that. Um, I don't even think page 24 gets into that at all. Although, but, but that would be my, uh, I think that's an important point that could be made with regard to the comparison aspect. Absolutely. And not just that humans do recreational fishing, but we also, with commercial fishing, it's very inefficient. The trawlers and just scraping the sea floor and collecting everything and only taking a few and so, so much destruction and death and waste occurs. We're not just taking what we need and leaving the rest behind. Sure, that's right. Another element to the wastefulness uh, is the, uh, the bycatch issue. Uh, which is unwanted, non-targeted organisms that are brought up by, as you say, trawling nets in particular are the worst for this. The shrimp industry is, is apparently the worst mm -hmm. of, of all the fisheries for so-called bycatch, which is these non-target animals, which are nevertheless maimed, uh, usually killed at some point while being hoisted up in the nets. Uh, in shrimping uh, in industries, there are some areas where a 10% a catch of shrimp versus 90% bycatch uh, is 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 a is a common occurrence, and those dead and dying animals are typically tossed back into the ocean. I mean, even if they're kept for other reasons, it's still a, a wasteful, horrible thing. Um, so, it's um it's estimated that uh, 200, 200 million pounds of bycatch are are discarded uh, every every day worldwide in the fishing industry. So um, that's another aspect. Another thing that I think can, worth mentioning here is just the it's so ironic that um, the, 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 uh, uh, an activity that is really, if you look at it closely, fishing in this case, is so brutal on the one hand, um, and yet so romanticized and accepted as a, as, a, as, a, as a nice way to spend a Sunday, a peaceful way of, of all ironies to spend a Sunday afternoon. Um, if you if you look at it, if you were to, I've, I've I've sometimes thought of if you were to make it into a terrestrial scenario, mm. um, just pick a, a mammal. Uh, let's say you're going fishing for squirrel, you would somehow have this line that you would lure them in and they would grab the food and you would hook them through the face, could be the mouth or or the eye. Eye injuries are very common in fishing, mm. uh, and then you you proceed to reel in the squirrel by the mouth. And then you pick the squirrel up, it was hanging by its weight. That's what happens to the fish. And then, then you drown it. Then you put it under the water, hold it under the water because the fish is coming into the air, into an element that it can't. Uh, I mean, that would, be, that, would be, that would be the height of cruelty to, to witness that, someone doing that. And yet that's essentially what happens to a fish in reverse, if, if you like. Um, it's, it's a pretty brutal activity. And it's really founded on this deep-seated, uh, I think, tacitly accepted or not idea that fishes uh, don't feel much or if anything uh, there's still debate around fish pain among a few scientists who would de deny it. it but it's a common belief among among fishermen that i've that i've i've heard it's quite a common belief i have to admit i haven't done a proper survey but um you know they don't feel much they why would they come back uh, and, and get hooked again you know if if it if it hurt well they're trying to make a living in there they're trying to get their food they're trying to get their, to see themselves through to the next day so i think it is important to think about it from the fish's perspective and i try to do that in this story without getting too graphic about the brutality nevertheless the suffocation aspect uh, ava can't breathe and also uh, the fact that she's, she feels a sensation she's never felt before, weight, the, the sense of weight of her body as she's hanging in the air. We are an ironic, ironic species, definitely. I, I agree with you on that. Unfortunately, your imagining of doing something similar to a squirrel, for example, I, I know that you see it as very cruel. I see it as very cruel. I don't know that everyone would see it as cruel because we... People do so many things to animals that they don't think twice about. But let's not encourage people to do that. I'm thinking of the movie Finding Nemo, where the sharks are trying to become vegetarian. <laughs> and they say, fish are your friends, not food. And uh, I've always held that image like that's something I would like to see underwater as well as above water. 
I remember a scene, I think it's Happy Feet, um, about the little uh, penguin. Uh, there's a scene where there's a captive setting or, of a penguin exhibit at a zoo. And it's a very brief, but there's a sign, like a protest sign that the, that the camera, it's an animated, of course, that pans across, uh, stop eating our food. Uh, it has a picture of a fish and it's, it's like it's telling the human, stop eating all the fish. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's a, a great little bit of advocacy right there. Um, you know, we, we share this planet with other organisms, but we need to share it better. We've been so selfish. We put up dams without thinking about it. And, the, and fish who have migrated up and down that waterway for thousands, if not millions of years, suddenly they can't. And we don't give it a moment's thought. It's all about us. And yes, we gradually begin to make pay attention and realize that we, 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 we need to modify these dams and make devices to help them by. But most dams in the world, I, I believe, don't have such provisions for fish uh, yet. Um, but I just use that as an illustration of how we're, we're very in focus towards ourselves. We're very anthropocentric, uh, an important word. And um, all of this stuff that we're talking about is, is about sharing the planet and being considerate of others. It's not, it's not rocket science it's basic values that i think most humans are raised with but we just have this twisted way of not applying it in certain ways that, that due to tradition and you know anytime anyone uses the the word tradition to defend a practice it's probably going to be a practice that, that that probably we need to we need to come up with new ways need to do away with it the word tradition can be a scary word things that we've accepted for so long that does not make it right. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it Fiddler on the Roof tradition? I know you're exactly. a singer. Yes, that song, that's right. tradition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's something that you you know in that context, it's usually used to defend something that's a little old fashioned and maybe needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And you see that in that in that story in that musical, how the tradition needs to change. Yeah. At least I got that out of it. I don't know that everybody's seeing it. See, it gets the same message. I did. I remember that feeling. <laughs> I think it's made pretty explicit, explicit in the story, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's interesting how one perceives something and how someone else perceives the same experience. No yeah, and, and that's anymore. the thing. Yeah, audiences vary. And uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see um, how audiences respond to this, to this book, to different kids and different grown-ups. One of the reasons why I love to talk about children's books on this program is that it doesn't take me very long to read them. <laughs> yes. But I still appreciate them very much. And I really enjoyed this. I read it several times and I may just take a moment to read it again. It's so lovely. Jake and Ava, a boy and a fish written by Jonathan Balcombe, illustrated by Rebecca Evans. Thank you. For Thank writing. you, Karen. Thank you, Karen, for doing this. I appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to speak with me again. Happy holidays to you. Happy New Year. Same to you and all your listeners. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Jonathan Balcombe, everybody. I highly recommend if you have small children that you know and they need something special for the end of the year, Jake and Ava, A Boy and a Fish is a lovely book for them and for everyone because we really need to get this message out about fish, about our planet, about species that feel and think and want to enjoy their world as nature has given it to them. While we're on the subject of sea animals, I just read an article and I will post it for this program. It's from the BBC News and it's entitled The World's First Octopus Farm Should It Go Ahead? Of course you know how I feel. What? No! They say news that the world's first commercial octopus farm is closer to becoming reality has been met with dismay by scientists and conservationists. They argue such intelligent, sentient creatures considered able to feel pain and emotion should never be commercially reared for food. Now, that's a really interesting statement, isn't it? Now, I agree, and I'm glad that scientists and conservationists are making this statement, and I really fear for the octopus, for the octopus, 
And I certainly hope this doesn't happen, although it looks like, as it says in the article, it's closer to becoming reality. But should we really commercially rear for food sentient creatures that are able to feel pain and emotions? Of course not. And this applies to all animals today that are raised for food. This applies to the cow. This applies to the pig. This applies to the duck and the goose. This applies to the turkey and the chicken. This applies to the buffalo. This applies to the dogs in some countries that are served for food. This applies to the horses that in some countries are served for for food. This applies to dolphins. This applies to whales. This applies to deer. We know that all of these animals feel pain and emotions. And even though underwater is more foreign to us than above ground, there's so much science now that supports that many species underwater, if not all of them, many, feel pain and have emotions. And somehow we have to make a change. Of course, my message to everyone is go vegan. I recommend reading this little story about (laughs) the octopus farm. One of the really sad things about it. Oh, there's just so many sad things about it. The report says that the farm will produce 3,000 tons of octopus per year. And the company is quoted as saying it will help stop so many octopus from being taken from the wild. How sensitive is that? The thing is, if you know anything about octopus and perhaps you saw the film, My Octopus Teacher, you'll know that octopus, not only are they amazing, but they're solitary and they're very smart. And putting them in these barren tanks that the article describes with no cognitive stimulation is horrifically cruel and wrong. And why do we need to do this? Now, you already know how I feel. I think you know how I feel. If you're new to this program, then you don't know how I feel about the growing biotech industry for food. I have a lot of concern about creating a variety of products that have the altruistic message that the products don't use animals and they're creating products that normally come from animals, but now come from plants. My concern, I have many concerns, but my concern has to do with putting a gazillion dollars, so much investment, into research for foods that are going to substitute animal foods that aren't good for us, aren't necessary. And we've already come up with so many different kinds of replacements or substitutions that are never going to be exactly the same, but we don't want them to be exactly the same. I just feel like the plant-based movement has been co-opted and we're moving in the wrong direction and we're spending a lot of money on it. Yes, of course, I want to minimize and eliminate animal suffering. Absolutely. And if there are products that people want to use that are going to keep them from supporting another product that harms animals, then of course, it's a good thing. But we don't really have a lot of evidence that, that these foods that are being created, like cultured meats and cell-based meats and, and some of these genetically modified foods are really doing that. So I wanted to bring to your attention another food that I just learned about. It's from a company called Melibio. Mel, maybe it's Melibio. Melibio Inc., Their tagline is, the future of honey, better for humans, better for bees. And they're quite pleased with themselves because they have created a product 
that does not come from bees. They say it's plant-based and it tastes just like honey. And my question is, why? Why invest all of that? Number one, if we're gonna talk about the health perspective, we live in a society that eats too much sweetener, mostly in, as refined sugar. But there are other forms of these sweeteners and honey is one of them. Now, some people will say, but honey's natural. Well, it's not necessarily natural that we go in and raise a ton of bees and steal their honey from them and feed them sugar water or high fructose corn syrup water. We like the taste of sweet foods. We are designed to like the taste of sweet foods from fruit because fruit is good for us. Refined sweeteners are not. And when we consume sweet foods, we want more of them. And many people get addicted to sweet foods. And this is true of refined sugar and it's true of honey. It's true of maple syrup. It's true of all kinds of sweeteners. So investing a huge amount of money in a company that's going to make honey, not from bees, but from plants. Why? Why? Because somebody thinks they're going to get a nice fat return on it and make a lot of money. And this is upsetting to me. We have all this knowledge and we're using all these brilliant scientists to do things that are not benef benefiting humanity. So it's another upsetting company that's out there. And there are so many of them doing all kinds of crazy things to create biotech foods, not from animals, to replace the animal. And when I originally heard this concept, I was excited about it. I thought it was great. And I thought it was great, especially in the industrial food sector, where people, for the most part, are buying these foods because they don't care about what's in them. And of course, some of, some of the people who buy these foods, it's not that they don't care. It's just that they don't have the means to buy other foods or they don't have access to buy other foods. And this is a whole nother subject, but this is, this is an important subject as well because I think industrial foods or accessible foods or inexpensive foods should be healthy for everyone and kind to animals and gentle on the planet. So many different directions I can go in here, but I don't like these biotech foods anymore because I really don't believe they're going to minimize animal suffering. Prove me wrong, please. I would love to see that. On the nice side, I don't have a problem with technology when it comes to creating sustainable, cruelty-free fashion and home goods, things like that. And I just learned about a company, maybe you've heard of them, Material Innovation Initiative. It's a nonprofit and they accelerate the development of sustainable animal free next gen materials for fashion, automotive and home good industries. And they partner with scientists, startup brands, investors, retailers to increase industry knowledge, facilitate collaborations, inspire innovators, inform investors and empower new and established companies. I'm reading from their website and something like this I can get behind. I can get behind innovation with technology when we don't have to consume it because what's best for humans is minimally processed or whole plant foods that have been grown organically in healthy soil. And maybe sometime science is going to come around and create something that is better for us, but it hasn't happened yet. And I am, I'm not going to gamble on it. <laughs> I think it's not going to be in our lifetimes if we see something like that. So technology can be used for good and it can be used for not so good. If the primary motive is to make a profit. That's the end of our program, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jonathan Balcombe. I certainly did. I'm going to 
be talking about another children's book next week called Gabriel, How Saving One Calf Changed an Entire Community. And this was written by Cheryl Moss. I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Cheryl. It's a beautiful book. And you'll hear more about that next week. And that's how we're going to wrap up the end of 2021. What a year, huh? Hey, everybody, I'm Karen Hartglass. I'm the host of It's All About Food since 2009. And you can find more about me at responsibleeatingandliving.com. That's the nonprofit I co-founded with my partner, Gary DiMatte. You can find loads of recipes up there as well as videos and all the archives for this show since 2009. Again, I love to hear your comments and questions. It's even more exciting when I meet you in person. I was actually at the vegetarian house this past week in San Jose with my partner Gary, and, and we met a listener, and it was, it was really fun to engage a bit. I welcome your comments and questions. You can always send an email to me at info at realmeals.org. I'm here for you. It's the end of the year. On our website, we have a lot of fun holiday recipes. If you're still looking for something that's fun, and even though, even though we're being encouraged now not to gather during the holidays because of crazy COVID, you can still prepare things at home with your immediate family that are fun and festive and good for you. And we have a lot of those recipes. And if you're looking for recommendations, maybe you can't navigate the website, send me an email and I'll help you out. Tell me what you're looking for. I'd love to hear from you. I wish you all the very best this week and all weeks. Have a delicious week.